The F8 Tributo was a swan song to the great mid-engined Ferrari V8. Perhaps a last hurrah for that engine as we know it. A celebration of Ferrari's rise to the pinnacle of internal combustion performance. But that was yesterday. Today, we live in a far more eco-conscious world. One that's making big, thirsty V8 engines, even the ones in Ferraris, extinct. Fossils fueled by other fossils. Times have changed, the world has changed. And so Ferrari faced a decision, evolve or die. And for their new car, the 296 GTB, Evolve is exactly what they've done. In the past, this would have been a screaming V12, maybe at a push, a screaming V8, but this is different. What we have here is a Ferrari going down a Spanish road really quite quickly in complete silence. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the sound of progress. Ferrari's new rear mid-engine Berlinetta dumps the 3.9-litre V8 found in the F8 in favour of a 2.9-litre V6, hence the name. It works alongside an electric motor and a small battery pack to drive the rear wheels. Total output is an astonishing 830 horsepower, 110 more than the Tributo. But while that plug-in hybrid powertrain is powerful, it also has other advantages. You're going to hate me for saying this, but it's really quite nice in here. Honestly, it starts up in hybrid mode by default, which means that it doesn't use the internal combustion engine. So you can pull away from a standstill in complete silence without annoying your neighbors. And then when you're on the move, it's super smooth and extremely quiet. I tell you what, it's actually a bit like driving my 4,000 pound secondhand Nissan Leaf. No offense, Ferrari, except this one costs 241,550 pounds. There are two Manatinos, basically control switches on the steering wheel that control the car's behavior. The one on the right-hand side is the traditional Manatino, and I'm sure most of us will know what that does. You can select wet, normal, race, CT off, everything off. And the one on the right is the e-Manatino, which controls how the electric drivetrain behaves. There's electric drive, which is batteries only, there's hybrid, and then there's performance, which is when the internal combustion engine just wakes up to remind you that it's there. And then there's qualifying, which is where you get the full beans. We're gonna experiment with that on a racetrack in just a while. But I just wanna knock it back into electric drive for a moment because this is a real novelty, an electric Ferrari. Do you know what? I know a lot of you out there will have worried about what an electric Ferrari might feel like, but let me reassure you, that's really nice. <laughs> the battery has a gross capacity of 7.46 kilowatt hours, and that gives it an EV only range of 25 kilometers. It takes around 2.5 hours to recharge at home. I don't know how many Ferrari owners will care about driving it in EV mode or saving fuel, but it does help with that too. I do like this interior as well. It's really nice. It's like being in a mini SF90. You've got a lovely big curved display in front of you. I do love this stitching, the leather. Everything looks like it's been really well crafted. The steering wheel looks absolutely phenomenal. The seats are a little bit on the hard side, but very supportive and we can live with it. All in all, it's a pleasant place to hang out. There's even Apple CarPlay, not just on the driver's screen, but also on an optional passenger screen, which is a nice touch. One of the things I don't like is the fact that the steering wheel houses almost all of your controls, your indicators, your lights, your wipers. And a lot of these controls are touch only, and sometimes they're not illuminated. It's not as elegant a solution as it could be. And while there is clear evolution and forward thinking in this car's powertrain, some might argue Ferrari has looked backwards in terms of its styling. The 296 takes inspiration from the old 250 LM made between 1963 and 1965. Only 32 examples were ever built, but its influence is clear from the wraparound windscreen to the distinctive rear haunches and flying bridge at the back, which showcases the new engine under a glass deck. 
It might be a small, low-mounted V6 flanked by high-voltage cables, but its presence is no less impressive. The rear, meanwhile, uses angular rather than rounded lights and a centrally mounted exhaust that allows for an especially large carbon fiber diffuser to create uninterrupted downforce. On the subject of downforce, there's a host of clever little touches dotted around this car that help to manipulate the air. The first of which is the tea tray, this area at the front. It's actually not big enough to accommodate a cup of tea or my Americano but it is very clever. Its purpose is to create pressure on the front of the car and to guide the air underneath the vehicle where it's further manipulated by the underfloor vortex generators. Then we have these headlights, which look great and are positioned as far off to the edges of the car as possible, just inboard of which we have these funky looking DRLs. And then just below those is quite a massive hole. You can actually get your entire fist through, no, don't worry, I'm okay. The purpose of that is actually to funnel air onto the brake calipers to keep the brakes cool. Don't worry, I'm fine. If we then look towards the top section of the car, what you'll notice is there isn't a fixed rear screen that runs from the roof to the back of the car, which means that it can be difficult to manipulate the air onto the rear spoiler. So Ferrari had to figure out a plan to deal with that air. And their solution was to create this rear wing which guides the air through a notch and works in conjunction with these two buttresses on either side to create a virtual windscreen. Plus it has the added benefit of dissipating heat away from this chimney area in order to keep this rear deck cool. Once the air reaches the back of the car, it's dealt with by this rear spoiler and this deployable rear wing. All of these elements work really well together, but if nothing else, they just look incredibly cool. But the big question is how does this evolution affect what Ferrari is best known for? Do the core changes detract from the core principles? Truly, there's only one way to assess that, and not in a normal road car. This one uses the 25,000 pound Assetto Fiorano package. It comes with adjustable Multimatic shock absorbers optimized for the track carbon fiber wings on the front bumper to deliver an extra 10 kilograms of downforce, a lightweight Lexan rear screen, Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2R tires, and more extensive use of carbon fiber in and outside the car that results in a total 12 kilogram weight saving. Time to see what that means for performance. Okay, well here we are out on the circuit trying to feel exactly what this car is all about down the main straight. It is super quick. So the headline figure is 830 horsepower. However, starting things off in performance mode, they sacrifice around 50 horsepower in order for the car to keep a consistent level of power. Now, I'll tell you what, it's still not bad having 780 horsepower to play with and it does feel remarkably quick. So headline acceleration figures, 0 to 62 in 2.9, so the same speed as the F8 Tribuso, but when you start building up a real head of steam is when it starts to really, really pull away. Woo, she's lively. 0 to 124 miles an hour, is done in 7.3 seconds, and that's 0.3 seconds quicker than the F8. But actually, it's not the acceleration itself that is impressive, it's the way the car puts the power down. There's never any turbo lag, there's never any delay, it's always instant, it's always on. It almost feels a bit like an electric car, because in a sense, when you pull away from a, a hairpin, there's always a shed load of torque and then the internal combustion engine takes over and from that point onwards it just pulls all the way up to 8,200 rpm and at that point when the engine starts to run out of puff that's when the electric motor kicks in again <laughs> and just gives it that little bit of a helping hand. The entire electrical system, batteries included, accounts for 130 kilograms, although this is offset by the lighter V6 saving 30 kilograms versus the larger, heavier V8. 
Total vehicle weight is a surprising 1,470 kilograms dry, and with a low center of gravity, rapid steering, and a 50 millimeter shorter wheelbase than the F8, it feels agile through low speed corners. Although, as the tires begin to overheat in these warm conditions, it was prone to some understeer in low speed corners and a slight nervousness in the quicker bends. What's it like for you, Chicane? So agile. Oh, it's such a joy through that, honestly. All right, we've got a bit of a hairpin here. Second gear, chuck it in. <laughs> it's super playful as well, honestly. But what's impressive is that you actually have to put down quite a lot of power to get the back end going. Let's try again here. Yeah, there's a lot of grip in the car. The 812 super fast could feel a bit spiteful, almost like it wanted to light up the tires at any given opportunity, but in the 296, it feels like you have to work it really hard to get the back end going out, and that's actually a good thing. Let's talk a little bit about the gearbox now. It's an eight-speed DCT. It's incredibly snappy, just so responsive. Whenever you need a gear, it's right there. The 296 also uses a brake-by-wire ABS Evo system that allows Ferrari to create a super stiff pedal, but one that's easy to use smoothly. A new six-way dynamic chassis sensor allows for more consistent and shorter braking distances. Now the brakes are interesting because they actually allow you to brake deeper into the corner. You can actually hold the brake in a straight line where you get full braking force, but as soon as you start to apply any turning lock, the car will actually reduce the braking force gradually to effectively allow you to trail brake without too much hassle. Okay, I'm gonna knock it up into qualifying mode now and see what it really does when you give it the full beans. So 830 horsepower, put the power down, and again, no lag whatsoever. It's such a fast car, it really is. Second gear, turn in. And despite having a shorter wheelbase, it's not especially spiteful in the bend. You can actually hold the slide. Incredible. It's no understatement to say that the 296 GTB is an immensely important car for Ferrari. It pushes the company's technical expertise to new limits in a way its previous cars didn't. It's forced them to evolve and embrace a new way of thinking. And it's understandable if some fans of the brand might have feared this change, as change usually means losing something we love or have grown accustomed to. But the 296 is an evolution that works better than expected. It's a car that offers the power and brutality, plus the deftness of handling we expect from old school Ferrari on track, with a new school approach that makes it a better, more refined Ferrari than we've ever seen previously on the road. This is a Ferrari at the very top of its game, a Ferrari that takes inspiration from its past while looking bravely towards its future.